Okay, so once again, good morning to you all, and welcome to our Monday morning plenary. Uh, our philosopher this week is going to be Thomas Hobbes, a very, very important, influential, and controversial English philosopher. I'm going to type his name and put his dates into the chat room. Some of you may know his name already, some of you may not. Born 1588 and lived 91 years died in 1679. Uh, now Hobbes um, is famous really in, in the philosophy world for two things. Uh, firstly, he is credited with being the founder of modern political philosophy. Uh, we've already seen from Plato um, a great deal of political philosophy, particularly in the Republic, where we found the core of his ethics also. Uh, but uh, Aristotle wrote about politics as well, and, uh, and, so, and so have other philosophers uh, uh, since, you know, them and prior to Hobbes. But Hobbes is, is someone who approached this subject in a sort of scientific way. Uh, his dates place him squarely in the early modern period. He was therefore a contemporary of René Descartes, whom we've studied in a, in a, in a, in a you know, an epistemological context. So he knew Descartes. Uh, they knew each other. They had met and uh, disagreed. Uh, I can tell you about that a bit later. Um, Hobbes also met Galileo um, in Italy, and I'm sure that some of you have heard of Galileo and knew that uh, Galileo got into trouble uh, with the uh, Roman Church for his uh, observations uh, about the planets and uh, the moon and, uh, and the sun and so forth. Um, have, you, have you heard about the Inquisition of Galileo? Does anybody know about this? If so, please say yes. Yes, Ramses, okay. Ashanti, yes, okay, that's fine. So this was an early modern time, uh, and it really was a, prior to what we now call the Enlightenment period in Europe. Uh, so the, the forerunners in this time were people who began to break away from the theocracy of organized religion. I mean, they were all living under monarchs, but the monarchs were very strictly religious, and paid allegiance one way or another to the Pope. And it was really forbidden in a certain sense to say anything that contradicted the dogma. Um, when, when science is under political control or under religious control, uh, if it's not allowed to do objective and dispassionate inquiry, then it, it's going to be held back. And uh, those uh, philosophers or scientists who dare to stand up to authority and pursue what we would like to call the truth for its own sake, may uh, encounter great danger because they, they will in fact risk their lives. And at times they may pay with their lives for uh, speaking what we would today call truths of power. And not because they want power themselves, but because they have honest minds and are interested really in furthering human understanding about laws of nature. So we saw Galileo, really you could say historically, that his work, uh, to a large extent, consisted of removing physics as a branch of theology and helping to establish it as a science in its own right, which, of course, it is today. And whether you're uh, a physicist who believes in God or whether you're a physicist who doesn't, this is really not part and parcel of the work you do as a physicist. Your religious beliefs, or lack thereof, can be seen on one side of the issue, but nothing to do with the science per se, not directly anyway. Uh, and uh, that's uh, l l largely owing to Galileo. And uh, you see Descartes establishing a method, and some of you have read, I know from your essays, that you read not only the meditations we covered, but you have looked a little bit into his method, and he's credited also with having presented this, this first sort of pre-modern notion of a scientific method. We also have Spinoza in Holland, who caused a great deal of trouble for himself by writing his own brand of independent philosophy, removing philosophy itself um, from, from politics and from political and religious control. And he was deemed a heretic and was excommunicated for that. And Hobbes got himself into hot water too, um, because he was all bent on the same mission. And really with Hobbes, we're going to see something really interesting, not only his view of human nature on which we're going to focus, but how that relates to how we live together and how we can manage to live together in a uh, let's say, a, um, a prosperous and harmonious society. That was his aim. Uh, so we'll get there. 
and uh, Hobbes uh, uh, wrote his great work Leviathan in exile actually from the English Civil War during the English Civil War uh, which um, which in itself speaks volumes about the tumultuous times uh, that he inhabited so uh, Thomas Hobbes was born in a very momentous year uh, 1588 this this may mean very little to, to many of you but uh, for anyone who uh, who is English uh, and indeed, uh, for Spanish people too, I think it's quite an important year, because 1588 was the year in which the Spanish Armada was launched as an invasion force against England. Has anyone heard of the Spanish Armada, a great fleet of, sh of ships? The Spanish Navy in the 17th century, 16th century rather, was supreme. The Spanish and the Portuguese during that century, 1500 to 1600, really... Um, in a certain sense, reach the apex of their powers uh, as empires, and Britain was not yet a great world naval power. So, uh, firstly, does anybody know what the Spanish Armada was? Has any of you have any of you heard of it? If not, that's fine. I'll give you a quick explanation, uh, and this this will be important to understand Hobbes because he himself mentions it in his autobiography. Okay, that's fine. Well, let, let's do a, just a little bit of history, just enough to make sense of this fellow Hobbes. So um, I'll bet that most of you have heard of King Henry VIII. And for some reason, King Henry VIII's name still floats around out there, just like you've heard of Plato and, and Descartes. And some of you undoubtedly have heard of King Henry VIII. Is that fair to say? Any of you? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, Jesse? Okay. King Henry VIII, Ashanti, yes. It's, it never ceases to amaise me out of this long line of British monarchs going back, you know, so far in history. That Henry VIII is a name that still people know. Well, why do you know him? What is the thing that's connected with his name that makes you aware of, of his existence? Anybody? What, what is Henry VIII well known for? You don't know? You know you know his name? But marriages, that's right, Jesse. He had seven or eight wives, not at the same time. So the story is, and this is important to understand, that he had fertility issues. Of course, nobody knew back then. Um, yes, that's good, Aisha. It's not influence in the church. It's, it's rather his rebellion against the Roman church. Um, but it has to do with his numerous wives. Now, he, wasn't, uh, he didn't have a harem of wives. He had one wife at a time. But he was unable to produce an heir to the throne. And today we would recognize this as, uh, as uh, you know, for what we would call fertility issues. But in those days, of course, they had no knowledge of this. So he just kept uh, changing wives, hoping eventually to, to bear an heir. And he did. He had one daughter, Elizabeth, who became a very famous queen. Um, and this is pertaining to the story of Hobbes. But basically, um, King Henry VIII uh, had to divorce his you know, in order to have a new wife, he had to divorce or execute, as the case may be, his prior wife or his present wife. And at one point, he asked the Pope for a divorce because, again, England was under the religious control of Rome, and, and the Pope said no. So Henry VIII got quite upset and, and said more or less, well, you know, I'm the king of England, and if I want to uh, divorce uh, my wife, I'm entitled to do so, and I'll just create a church. And uh, since I'm king, I'll be head of the church, and then I can... Um, have the archbishop of the church grant me a divorce. And that's exactly what he did. He created the Church of England. But that was only to get himself divorced. Uh, but the European powers uh, looked askance at this because everybody else saw it as a threat and a challenge to the authority of the Pope. And they were all, more or less at this point, um, Catholic countries mostly. So they decided to uh, basically teach Henry VIII a lesson or rather his daughter Elizabeth, and, and what they decided to do was to invade England and reestablish a you know, Catholic monarchy. Because his daughter, Queen Elizabeth, liked the church and made it the official religion of England. To this day it is, Church of England, yes, led by the Archbishop of Canterbury. In America we have the Episcopalians, it's a derivative of the, of the Anglican church. So the Spanish had this great navy, and they put together a huge army made of different... Uh, troops from different countries, and they sailed, set sail to England in order to invade in 1588. 
uh, a storm blew up. This is like an amazing thing, almost kind of miraculous. Well, it's not miraculous that there'd be a storm in the English Channel. It's a very stormy patch of sea. But nonetheless, a great storm blew up just as this invasion fleet was en route. And it completely blew them off course. And many ships were sunk. They were heavy ships, Spanish galleons full of troops and, and weapons and, and cannonballs and things. And they just went to the bottom. And a lot of them got blown all the way around the coast of Scotland. Uh, some of them even washed up on the Irish coast and settled there. You can find today in Ireland descendants uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the survivors of the Spanish Armada who settled there. Of course, Ireland is a Catholic country, so they were welcome. But England was spared. And this was the year that Thomas Hobbes was born, in April of that year. And Hobbes wrote in his autobiography that his mother gave birth to twins, himself and fear. Uh, he said that she was so afraid when news of the Spanish Armada reached the public, you know, that this great fleet was en route to invade England, that she gave birth to him prematurely, says Hobbes. Uh, that was because of her fright at the news that the Spanish Armada was approaching so it's kind of an interesting historical tidbit. And he speaks of twins. He says she gave birth to him and fear. And we will see very shortly that fear plays an important role in Hobbes' philosophy, in, primarily in his ethical and political philosophy. So we'll have a look at that momentarily. Uh, Hobbes was uh, of very ordinary middle-class origins. His father was a kind of a preacher, uh, but not very successful. And uh, Hobbes showed promise as a student, take note, although his family had no influence and no money. A wealthy uncle uh, saw that Hobbes had promise and so sent him to Oxford, not to one of the main colleges, but to Magdalen Hall, uh, a place where he was still able to study classics and, and divinity. And uh, at that time in Oxford, uh, there were only two subjects on offer, classics and divinity, classics being well, we still have classics in the universities, although it tends to be called by other names. So he studied Greek and Latin and read, therefore, the great works by the Greek and, and, and Roman authors, including the philosophers and poets. And he also studied divinity, which is today theology. So he studied the Bible and also uh, uh, older scriptures in Hebrew, as they still study them today in the traditional courses. So Hobbes was schooled in this very... Uh, sort of uh, ancient, almost medieval way. Uh, there were no scientific subjects on offer at that time. In fact, mathematics was not even on offer at Oxford at that time. Hobbes graduated in the early 1600s, and the first time that geometry was actually taught at Oxford was 1619. After he graduated, they established a chair of geometry and a chair of astronomy. So this will tell you in the early modern times that there was no science being taught in the universities, unlike today. Okay, so Hobbes succeeded because of his studies in becoming a secretary and a scribe to various important families. He was promoted to a, a position where he was serving some very powerful families. That's how he got to travel in the continent and meet Galileo and, and meet Descartes and meet some of the other leading philosophers there and, and foment discussions with them. And then he came back to England. And at this point, uh, Elizabeth, who was the queen when Hobbes was alive, um, she had uh, basically... Uh, died childless, and uh, you you may also know this. Uh, she was a very famous queen go called Good Queen Bess Elizabeth the first, primarily because she, her era, which is still called the Elizabethan era, was the time of Shakespeare. Uh, it was a time when they were spared from the Spanish Armada. It was the time of these great playwrights. Uh, in the English language. Certainly Shakespeare has never been equaled as a playwright in the English language. We still study him today for good reason. And she had an affair with this pirate, Sir Francis Drake. You know, a very, very uh, uh, sort of scandalous, but at the same time enjoyable uh, scandal. So Francis Drake was this pirate who was helping to, uh, you know, loot Spanish <laughs> and other ships if he could catch them on the high seas and enrich the treasury of England. So there was this kind of romantic... Uh, uh, business attached uh, to that kind of war. But basically, she also had the same fertility issues as her father, and so was not able to bear a child. 
And so that was a big thing after her death. They had to find a new lineage, and they brought the Stuarts from Scotland, the House of Stuart. Uh, and uh, the first king was King James I. And some of you may know of the King James Bible, which is still in use. I mean, he, he made that the official Bible in the English language. That was okay, but his son is the one who got into trouble. His son, Charles I, uh, is the one who basically got embroiled in the English Civil War. So long story short, Hobbes was serving these powerful families and also uh, had worked his way into a position because of his brilliance as a scholar, uh, as a translator, a classic scholar, and also as a burgeoning philosopher. He had become a tutor to the Prince of Wales, to Charles I's son, Charles II. And this is the time during which the English Civil War broke out, uh, 1642 to 1651 were the dates. And Hobbes was profoundly affected by this. He thought that a civil war was a horrible thing, and it was worse in some ways than international war, uh, because it was more like a war within a family, and it, there were always going to be bad feelings no matter which side won. It would never really be over. Whereas he remarked, in international wars, we can make peace with our enemies and we can be on good terms with them. And if you look at historical examples in the ensuing centuries, I think you'll see very clearly that he was right about this. So just think from your own knowledge of history that we had, for example, World War II, where the U.S. Uh, and the Allies were fighting against Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and imperial Japan. And now we have wonderful relations with all of them, right? We have, we have lots of trade, cultural exchange, and so forth. So they're not our enemies anymore. Uh, and you can think about England and the USA. We had a very, very difficult and, and, and atrocious war of independence against England, when, when America, you know, became an independent nation, the 13 colonies separated, and it was a devastating war, but England and the U.S. eventually became great allies and still are best of friends. So those are just quick examples of how international conflicts can end up in, in fact, very peaceful uh, economic and cultural friendships between the nations formerly at war. Whereas you may contrast this with civil war, and understand that civil wars are not so easily resolved even if the open hostilities end. The American Civil War is still being waged in certain respects in this culture. I think you can see that quite plainly, uh, that there are elements of the Civil War that are really still, in a certain sense, being carried on. And perhaps some of you come from countries which un unfortunately have endured civil wars or have seen civil wars on your borders in neighboring countries, and you realize that those conflicts tend to protract themselves over time. Is that clear? I mean, from your own knowledge? All right, so this is Hobbes's point. So his real challenge in writing this masterpiece of what we today call modern political philosophy, the foundation of it, Leviathan, the name of the book, is an attempt to resolve the problem of civil war, and he does so at least in theory, he gives us an understanding of how it is that we can move from a state of civil conflict to a state of commonwealth, a commonwealth being a kind of a state where people live in a reasonable amount of harmony and, and, and can become prosperous and remain at peace with each other. That's called a commonwealth. We still have the British Commonwealth today, which is a peaceful and prosperous alliance of former colonies. 40 or 50 nations in this world belong to the commonwealth. It's, it's very prosperous alliance of countries. Some of the states in this union are called commonwealths. Some of you may know this. If you drive to Massachusetts, when you get to the border of New York and Massachusetts, you're going to see a sign that welcomes you to the commonwealth of Massachusetts. There are quite a few states in the union that are called commonwealths. So that's the term that refers to a peaceful and prosperous society. And Hobbes wanted that, uh, but he was forced to take sides in the Civil War as often happens. You may know that the American Civil War cut right through families. It cut right through. There were times when brothers or fathers were actually, you know, fathers and sons or brothers were fighting against each other on different sides of the Civil War. It cut right through, cut right through the family lines. Very difficult. So this was Hobbes's problem. And he wrote the Leviathan in exile. 
he was already in enough trouble in England, having taken the side of the monarch. Uh, the fight in England was complicated, but, but, but part of it translated into a power struggle between Parliament and, mon and the monarchy, because the monarchy had absolute power, more or less, and Parliament uh, wanted more and more. They wanted to take some power away and let it go to the people by their elected representatives. We, we understand that story very well, a uh, story of modern democracy where presumably people are governed, you know, by, the, by their consent. They elect people to office. They're not any longer governed by hereditary monarchs, except in the case of dynastic families, one could say. But in any case, Hobbes was caught up in this. And what he saw was lawlessness and chaos and violence and a complete breakdown of society. And it really upset him. And he thought that uh, the way to restore order in this case was going to be uh, to allow the monarch to, to take charge. Uh, but uh, th this uh, made him very unpopular, and in fact, he feared for his life. His life was in danger at some point. So he went to Paris with uh, the royal family. King Charles II um, was, uh, with his mother, a French princess and queen of England now, w w were sent to be safe in Paris, and uh, uh, King Charles I was fighting against Oliver Cromwell, of whom you probably heard, who represented the parliamentarian forces. And that was the Civil War. And Hobbes had to flee for his life as well. So uh, he went in 1640 uh, to Paris to, in fact, tutor Prince Charles II in geometry and classics. And he wrote the Leviathan in exile in Paris. It took him 11 years. It's a masterwork. Uh, he pre presented it to Prince Charles in 1651. But what's in the Leviathan, as we'll see momentarily, was so controversial at the time that it also, uh, once the French priests read it and the, you know, the Catholic authorities on the continent read it, they immediately placed it on the Roman index of banned books uh, because the Roman church had a long list of books that were not allowed to be read by people. And they, that, that was uh, placed on the list. And also the, uh, the, the clergy were preparing to arraign Hobbes on charges of heresy against the Pope because there's a whole, all the whole parts, parts of, of the Leviathan are indeed deemed heretical by the standards of those days. And if they had, if they had succeeded, uh, then they would have probably burned him at the stake. So he was actually obliged to flee because he lost his diplomatic immunity for other reasons, and, and the, the, he lost the protection of the English court. So he had to go back to England and take his chances with Cromwell, who left him alone, pretty much. And after the restoration of the monarchy, uh, Hobbes was left alone and given a small pension. But even even uh, King, King Charles II, whom he had tutored as a boy, forbade the reading of the Leviathan in the English language. So this was one of the greatest works of political philosophy ever written, and it was forbidden to be read by the people for whom it was written initially. So that should give you some idea of the turbulent times that uh, Thomas Hobbes inhabited, and I'm saying this as a backdrop to give you a, a context for what we're about to see. Okay, is that fair enough? Or are we clear on, on this little bit of background? You can read more about him. He's a very famous philosopher. And uh, if you're curious about his life and times, uh, then by all means, uh, have a look at sources online. There's a lot been written about him. OK, but we're now going to focus on his ethics. And he's not going to take very long to tell us what he thinks about good and bad, right and wrong. He's going to spell it out pretty quickly. Now, Hobbes is going to hold up a mirror. Uh, he, he is really going to philosophize about human nature in a way that made people upset. And I think that there are basically uh, two ways in which you can upset people. Uh, it, you can tell lies about them, you'll definitely upset people. Or you can tell truths about them, and you'll definitely upset others by doing that. And Hobbes was, was telling something to us uh, about ourselves and about our nature, which people at the time did not want to hear particularly. And t today, there's still, there's still a lot of uh, controversy surrounding Hobbes's view of human nature. Yes, Ramses, you could say you could say it's easy to get into trouble, especially these days. No matter what you say, someone's bound not to like it. But uh, as long as we enjoy the protections of the First Amendment, we're entitled to speak our minds. Um, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, leave that aside. Uh, so 
so Hobbes is going to repudiate both Plato and Aristotle very early on. He's going to disagree with both of them, and he's going to propose his own theory. I know that a lot of you are psychology students. We have quite a few psychology majors in, in this group. And so you will have already understood that the philosophers that we have studied so far, including Hobbes, we're really also psychologists because they're they're looking at human happiness, they're looking at human flourishing, they're looking at the causes uh, uh, and the cures for various kinds of unhappinesses that humans create for themselves and others. And this is partly today the province of psychology, but at the time, uh, you know, we're 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 really seeing that psychology was not yet an independent science of any kind, and it was part and parcel of what people called philosophy in general. And so were, were the other sciences. I think you've understood that by now, that philosophy was the sort of parent of all the sciences that we today study. They were initially done by philosophers, and they didn't call themselves scientists. They called themselves natural philosophers if they were doing theoretical science, or empirical philosophers if they were doing experimental science. And so the scientific revolution came later during the Enlightenment, but up until the early modern times, they were they were just called philosophers. Nonetheless, they were obviously studying human nature in just the same way uh, as as many psychologists would study it today. So psychology, in that sense, is also uh, the child of of philosophy. All right. So what does Hobbes have to say? Let's now turn to some extracts. I've uploaded this uh, to your Google Drive folders, of course, before the start of the semester. And you can find it there. I'll share the screen with you now. And we'll have a look at some highlighted extracts from the Leviathan. Just bear with me while I do so. You can read the whole thing if you have the time and gumption to do it. It's quite a big, thick book. But it's very carefully reasoned. It's very carefully argued. Hobbes was deeply impressed by Euclidean geometry and its method of developing theorems and proving things and then using those proofs as as premises and new arguments and developing more proofs based on that. So the whole thing is built up very logically and cogently into a great body of knowledge of geometry. And Hobbes tries to do the same thing with human nature and politics. He's trying to give us an understanding of the causes of human conflict and therefore uh, its proper resolution. That That's the whole point of his Leviathan. But it is a very uh, detailed work, for sure. That's why I've just picked out some highlights for you, which will give us enough to know about his ethics. Are you able to see the screen? Can you all see this? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So Leviathan is actually uh, from uh, the scripture. It's a Hebrew name, Leviathan. It means a great sea creature, a great sea monster of some kind. And Leviathan is Hobbes' view of the metaphor for the, for the state, you know, as a great uh, beast, as it were, consisting of many different parts. And he wants, again, to bring the state into... Uh, a status of peace and harmony and good relations and out of civil war. What we'll see later, and you might want to remember this, is that his solution to the problem of civil war is actually a quite a good one. And part of the kernel of that solution is to give us something that's today called social contract theory or social contractarianism. And he's one of the originators of this idea. And there are different versions of the social contract. But basically, it's Hobbes who gives us a, a fairly detailed picture of how a social contract could be enacted so that people could live together in peace and harmony. And yet, the grand irony, and Hobbes was well aware of this, is that his solution to the problem of civil war by a social contractarianism is going to lead different countries into a state where they will possibly end up in international wars. And so his problem is solved on the one hand, but the solution to the civil war problem will potentiate international war. 
So people still study Hobbes for, from that perspective. And if you're doing international relations or, you know, that kind of political science, uh, then you will see in Hobbes this grand irony. And he was well aware of it. He did not take it upon himself in any practical way to attempt to solve the problem of civil of, of international war. His, his, his thesis is limited to solving the problem of civil war only. And it has thus far defeated all the great minds ever since to solve the problem of international war. And Hobbes tells us why that problem, in his view, cannot be solved. And we'll see that uh, on Thursday in my group. But in any case, let's go back to the beginning. And he wants to talk about us as animals, basically, and looking at our voluntary and involuntary drives. He's doing a very you know, primitive kind of uh, basically uh, sociobiology, which didn't exist at that time either. But he is pointing out something here, and that's highlighted in, in yellow. Uh, he's, he's talking about love and hate. And he's talking in the sense that we uh, love things, he said, that we are attracted to and hate things that we're averse to. Yeah? So attraction and aversion are going to be two primary motivators of human behavior and of human relations. We have attractions in life and we have aversions in life. And Hobbes says that if we are desirous of something or attracted to something, then we will say we love that thing or that person, and if we're aversive <laughs> to, to something or someone, then we will say we hate that thing or that person. So these, for him, are synonymous. He's not romantic. He's saying desire and love are the same thing. If you desire something, you're going to say you love it. And if you say you love something, it's because you desire it. Okay, this is, this is Hobbes' is very practical and very naked kind of definition of love. It's really about desire. And similarly, hate is really about aversion, right? Or being desirous of avoiding something. Um, so now he's going to tell you, and this is really pretty close to the beginning, chapter 6. I've skipped, of course, quite a bit. But chapter 6 is where he tells us uh, this is going to be the foundational part of his ethics. And he doesn't mince words. He says as follows, whatsoever is the object of any man's appetite or desire. That is it which he for his part calleth good, and the object of his hate and aversion evil. So please pay very close attention. He goes on, these words of good, evil, and contemptible are ever used with relation to the person that useth them, there being nothing simply and absolutely so. So in other words, for Hobbes, morality is initially entirely subjective. So you say that uh, you, you, you call something good only because you like it, not because it has any inherent goodness. Uh, and you say you, uh, uh, you call something bad because, or evil because you dislike it, not because it has any inherent badness. So who is he contradicting here when he says there is nothing simply or absolutely good? Anybody? Who's he contradicting? The church. Who, who, yes, Aristotle, and who else? Plato. Both, correct. He's very directly contradicting both of them, yes? Because remember, Aristotle is saying that goodness is the practice of virtue, and that virtue is going to make us happy, and Hobbes is going to disagree with that too in the next chapter. But he's, he's you know, for, for Aristotle, the virtues are universal. For Hobbes, that's nonsense. Hobbes says, no, 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 you, you like something, whatever it may be, so you call it good. You may like adultery, so you're going to call it good because you like it, right? Or you may like monogamy, uh, you're going to call it good because you like it. It's got nothing to do with whether it's a virtue or a vice. It's just because of your subjective taste. And so that's definitely a contradiction of Aristotle. And in the next sentence, he contradicts Plato by saying, there's nothing simply or absolutely good. In other words, he's contradicting the pure form of good. He's saying, that's nonsense. There's no such thing as that. Hobbes is a materialist. He doesn't believe in anything immaterial. So he's saying, there's no such thing as the pure forms. There's no such thing as a pure form of good. It's just a word we use to describe what we like. 
And Spinoza picked this up from Hobbes and is very famous for saying the same thing. Uh, and, and that's what you meant that day. Okay, Orsh, well, that's now you, now you find it in the mouth of Hobbes, okay? And that there is nothing absolutely good or bad in the world. It's just a question of basically uh, what we like and dislike. So in other words, if you like something, you call it good. If you dislike something, you call it bad. But it's based really on your emotions, isn't it? On your feelings toward the thing and nothing to do with the thing itself. Is that clear? Yeah, three thumbs up for Marsh. All right, it's clear. Jesse is clear. All right. And maybe some of you agree with this. And Spinoza said the same thing and got into a lot of trouble as well for saying it. Spinoza said, we don't, we don't uh, uh, like things that are good. We don't like something because it's good. Rather, we call something good because we like it. All right? If your friend says to you, you know, if you read any, did you read any good books lately? You're going to recommend a book you like, isn't it so? Did you see any good movies lately? Well, you're going to represent, you're going to, I mean, if someone asks you that question, presumably you're, you're going to recommend a movie that you like. Yes? So goodness is a, is a synonym there for what, you, for what you like. And badness would also be similarly a synonym for what you don't like. Does this make sense to you? Anyone? Think about it, okay? What about things that people unanimously like? Well, give me give me an example, Ramses, of something that people unanimously like, if you can. Is there something that people unanimously like? Yes, but but that that you but this is Arsh. You're now off the topic. We're, there's a question here that's been asked. Let's try and stay on focus, okay? The question is by Ramses. What about things that people unanimously like? I'm asking for an example of something that people unanimously like. I think it would be very difficult to find such an example. Well, nothing. If, it, if well, that that would be Hobbes's point. If if it's completely. Uh, a question of subjective taste, you're never going to find anything that anybody unanimously likes. Remember, I think it was Abe Lincoln who said you can't please all the people. You can please some of the people some of the time, right? But you can't please everybody all the time, and that's precisely for this reason. That uh, That's okay. You can use the chat room, Ramses. Uh, the, point, the point being that I don't think there's anything in this world that is unanimously taken to be good or bad. Uh, and I'm not necessarily saying I agree with Hobbes completely. I'm just saying that we all have different tastes, do we not? I mean, empirically, it's very clear we all have different tastes. Now, there may be certain things that a majority of people endorses, such as a political candidate, but that still doesn't mean that everybody likes that person. You're always going to find people who vote against somebody, right? No matter how many people vote for somebody. In American politics, 60% is a huge victory. You know, if, if for example a candidate for governor or mayor or president, somebody who got 60% of the vote would be said to have won by a huge margin. But that still means 40% of the people didn't vote for that person, meaning they don't like him or her. So you see, uh, you're not going to be able to find anything with, with any degree of, of facility such that everybody likes it. Um, and that's Hobbes's point, that it is totally subjective. So we will expect difference of opinion right from the beginning about what's good and bad. If indeed what's good and bad is grounded in our own personal tastes, we're never going to get universal agreement. But that's part of the problem. Do you begin to see how that sets us up for conflict? This is going to bring us into conflict. All right. So now uh, we have to understand Hobbes' definition of power. And I've just taken one sentence out of chapter 10. I encourage you to read this book in greater depth if you're interested. Uh, the book is public domain. Obviously, you can find PDFs of it online. Download the whole thing if you wish. But Hobbes' definition of power is very, very different than most people's. Hobbes says that your power is your ability to, in, at the present time, to obtain some future apparent good. Now, you need to think about this very carefully. Okay? It's not complicated, but it is subtle. He's saying that your power is your ability to get what you think is good. So if you're able to get what you like, remember, what you think is good is what you like, yeah? So if you're able to get what you like pretty much on a regular basis, then Hobbes would say you're a powerful person. 
which is very interesting, isn't it? Because it doesn't have anything to do with money directly. It doesn't have anything to do with social standing directly. Uh, so it only has to do with your likes and dislikes. And if you're able to get pretty much what you like to get on a given day, then you're a powerful person. On the other hand, uh, you may still have a lot of uh, money um, and a lot of uh, you know social standing, but you may not be able to get what you like. So Hobbes would say, well, you're not very powerful then. So he's divorcing power from these objective measures of wealth, for example, or uh, what's on your business card. <laughs> he, he's simply saying that if you're able to get what is good for you, in other words, what you like, then you're a powerful person. Is that clear? This is quite important. So I want you to bear it in mind because he's going to build up a very, a very uh, interesting chain of deduction based on these different points to explain to us the source of human conflict and its resolution. Okay, I'm glad. Now, he is clear. And this is pretty amazing because th th this is, you know, these are his own words uh, in 1651. That's coming on to 500, you know, 400 years, right? 400 years. Uh, so we can still read the English pretty clearly. All the sentences are a little longer than they are today. Okay, now this is also very important. Chapter 11, the difference of manners. Now, look. Uh, manners can mean two things. It can mean etiquette uh, or, or it can mean, uh, you know, way of life. And he means way of life now. So that's what he says. By manners, I mean not here decency of behavior, which we would today call etiquette, such as how you would s greet somebody or how you wash your mouth or pick your teeth or table manners or these things called small morals. The word for that would be etiquette. He's not talking about etiquette like if people have good manners or bad manners. We, we, we generally lump that under the head of etiquette, yeah? But he's not talking about that kind of manners. He's talking about the way in which we live together. So our manner of life is the larger meaning of the word manner. And here he's going to contradict, once again, the philosophers we've already studied. He says, to which end, if we're looking at our manner of life, we are to consider that the felicity of this life consisteth not in the repose of a mind satisfied. Felicity is a word we don't use much anymore in English, unfortunately. The language has become quite impoverished over the last few decades. But felicity is still used often as a girl's name. It used to be very popular a name for girls. You still might meet a woman or a girl named Felicity, uh, but it means happiness. Okay, it's a synonym for, for a kind of happiness. And not a long-lasting happiness, but a momentary happiness. and Or rather, a string of small happinesses put together. So felicity is a kind of happiness. So he says we're not talking about uh, a satisfied mind. He doesn't think happiness comes from a satisfied mind. For there is no such finis ultimus utmost aim or goal, he says, nor summum bonum greatest good, as is spoken of in the books of the old moral philosophers. Who's he talking about, again, when he says there is no such thing as a satisfied mind uh, or indeed a greatest good as spoken of? That's right, Ramses. Again, you, you got the point. When he says there's no such thing as a satisfied mind, he's, he's refuting Aristotle's idea of eudaimonia, right? Lasting happiness. And when he says there's no such thing as a, as a greatest good... He's refuting who? who? Who who talks about the greatest good? Plato, right. The pure form of good is the greatest of the pure forms, right? So Hobbes immediately refutes both of them. And he says instead that in the first place, in the first place I put for a general inclination of all mankind, now he's telling us about something that pertains to everybody, a perpetual and restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. So what does he mean by this? He means that everybody is almost always in a state of wanting something. Remember your power, be careful to remember his definitions. His definition of power is your ability to get what you think is good, right? In other words, to get what you like. And he's saying that in general, all people are constantly seeking to get what they like from day one to day last. 
whether you're a child or an adult or an elderly person, you're always going to get up in the morning wanting something and trying to get that thing. And this never ends for us. We're always in a state of wanting something. Whatever you have, you're always going to want something else. And whatever stage of life you're in, you're always going to have some desire for something. Is it not, is it not the case? Well, you say sure, as though that were obvious, but, you know, Hobbes is, 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 is really uh, giving us a kind of psychological law, which he means to pertain to all of humans. And so uh, Ramsey says, so, so he thinks that people are inherently egoists. That's exactly right, Ramsey's. And this will get played out in more depth in a few minutes. Yes. So, yes, you want to think about it, but let me uh, help you to see it through Hobbes's point of view. You don't have to agree with him, but... When you get up in the morning, aren't there things you want to do during the day? I mean, when you get up in the morning, there are certain things that that you want to accomplish, hopefully. Uh, there are certain things that you want to do or certain things that you want to obtain that you think are good for you, uh, whether it's, a, whether it's a, you know, an accomplishment or whether it's a thing you need to buy or whether it's something else you need to do. But we always get up with something on our minds. Uh, we're not getting up in a state of, uh, of, of happiness uh, or of a you know permanent uh, euphoria, or a, a, a world in which we we're content because we glimpse the forms of things. We're always restlessly seeking things in life. That that's what he's claiming. That people always whether we you know every child wants something. Is it not the case? Every child is always wanting something or other, constantly. And uh, well, he he's talking about all of it. He's not differentiating between necessities of life. Uh, or the more sophisticated pursuits that human humans can engage in. He, he just wants to assert that we all have this restless desire for power after power. Again, remember, your power is your ability to get what you like, right? Get what you think is good, and that this may grow over time, but you're still going to always want things. No matter how much power you have, you're always going to want more. And it never ends. And it never ends. All right. So this is the problem uh, that is going to set us up for conflict. And in chapter 13, he gives us a very moving and <laughs> controversial to this day theory of what causes conflict. It's, uh, it's a theory of what he calls the natural condition of mankind concerning their felicity and misery, their happiness and unhappiness. And he's going to define for us what he calls a state of nature. He wants to ask the question of what was it like for people to live before governments? What, what, kind, of a, what kind of arrangements did we have uh, before we had a civilization? You know, what was it like in our earliest days? And what, what, what was our manner of life before we had, uh, you know, constitutions and governments of any kind? What were we like in our state of natural being? So he says the following, and this is quite interesting for 1651, that he actually thinks that nature has made us quite equal in a certain way. He says, even though, you know, some we can find some who are stronger, obviously, you know, who could lift more weight or, you know, excel at various physical contests, or some who are quicker in mind, some who are learn quicker than others and so forth. He says, yeah, but these differences are not so great even though some are stronger in body or quicker in mind. He says, that's not such a big deal. He says, because all of us have one basic thing we all share. And that for him is the ability of the weakest to kill the strongest, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others. So in other words, Hobbes says that we're all equal because we can all kill each other if we really put our minds to it. This is not the kind of equality you may be accustomed to thinking about. But in a state of nature, he says, anybody can kill anybody. And what we find typically is when people who are very powerful are assassinated, uh, they're often assassinated by people who have no power at all in society. If you think about that, people who, the, the, the guy who assassinated Gandhi, the guy who assassinated JFK, whoever it was, we think it may have been Lee Harvey Oswald, but that's not settled. The guy who assassinated Robert Kennedy, Sirhan Sirhan, uh, the guy who assassinated Martin Luther King. These were not particularly powerful people, and yet they were able to kill people who were extremely powerful. And whether they acted alone 
or whether they acted by confederacy. We have this history of Julius Caesar. They, everyone was so afraid of him. It took nine of them to assassinate him, right? There was a conspiracy that eventually assassinated Julius Caesar. Shakespeare wrote about it in his play. But it took nine of them to muster up the courage to kill this guy. So Hobbes is saying anybody can kill anybody, and that's what makes us equal. This is not a very positive <laughs> or, 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 or very happy-sounding notion of equality, but it's quite realistic in a certain sense. I think you have to grant him that. Right? So he goes on to make a very subtle point uh, that may elude some of you because English humor is very dry. So if you're able to get a laugh out of this, go ahead. There is humor in this. He says, for such is the nature of men that howsoever they may acknowledge others to be more witty or more eloquent or more learned, yet they will hardly believe there be many so wise as themselves, for they see their own wit at hand and others at a distance. So this proveth rather that men are in that point equal, rather equal than unequal, for there is not ordinarily a greater sign of the equal distribution of anything than that every man is contented with his share. This is an enormously sarcastic and ironically funny passage. If it went over your heads, it's because you're not used to English humor. But what Hobbes is saying is that you will see us protesting, you know, that there's an unequal distribution of wealth. You will see us protesting about all kinds of things. You'll see people protesting because they want more of something, whether it's rights, whether it's equity, whether it's opportunity. We will be constantly protesting that others have more of something than we do, and we think that's unfair. But Hobbes says you'll never see anybody protesting that other people have too much wisdom and they don't have enough. You don't see anybody marching with signs that say we want more wisdom, <laughs> right? You'll never see that kind of protest. And Hobbes is saying you never see that kind of protest because everybody thinks they're wise enough. In other words, we're all, in the end, conceited. We're all egoists, as one of you said earlier. So if, if you don't see the humor in this, think it over. He goes on to say something much more serious, that from this equality of ability, in other words, everybody has a reasonable expectation of getting what they want out of life. That's the point, says Hobbes, that we all get up in the morning with a reasonable expectation that if we do, you know, whatever it is we need to do, we're going to get what we want. So we have equal hope in getting what we want in life. And that's what brings us into conflict. This is a very interesting and a very different than normal thesis. Hobbes is saying it's not inequalities that perpetuate conflicts in society. It's the equality of everybody thinking that they can get what they want from life. And if people both, if two people think they can both get what they want from life, if they should happen to desire the same thing, which they cannot both enjoy, they're going to become enemies. They're going to end up in conflict. Is this clear to you? You need to think about it carefully because he's proposing something that's quite different from what you're used to. OK, something you're not used to thinking about. You're thinking inequality is a source of conflict, and it well may be. I'm not saying that it isn't. But Hobbes is saying think more carefully, and you'll see that if people have equality in the sense that they all think they can get what they want out of life, so they have equal hopes. If our hopes are equal, that's not going to be the end of conflict. It's going to be the beginning of conflict. Because if we all have the same hope of getting things, there are going to be things we can't all share, and that's going to bring us into conflict. If you're all competing for a job, if you're all competing for a place in graduate school, if you're all competing for a, for a, for a significant other, then definitely uh, you're going to end up potentially in conflict with each other. Oh, you you know, we, Hobbes has been telling neoliberals that for a long time, Jesse. Whether they listen or not is another matter. But in any case, um, here are the three co causes of conflict that he, that he enunciates. And so the first one is what he calls quarrel, right? This is, you know, social conflict. And the first one is competition. And some of you are pointing out that, yeah, this is evolutionarily what's been selected for us. It was evolutionarily adaptive when we were living in small hunting and gathering bands, perhaps. But it's not always evolutionarily adaptive in civilizations. And we'll come to this later. But it, there's no question that competition brings people into conflict, obviously. And diffidence is the second cause. Diffidence is an old word, again, another word that's been stripped from the language that we don't use anymore. 
Uh, it's a synonym. Those of you who speak Spanish will understand it because the root word is, is fido or fidere, to trust, and diffidence is mistrust. Okay, mistrust. Diffidence means mistrust of others. And thirdly, glory. And glory is your ego, your reputation, your status, your standing, being respected by others. Okay, that's the third cause. When people disrespect each other, they definitely are drawn into conflict. So the first cause, namely competition, makes people invade in order to get things from each other before someone else gets them. The second uh, is uh, diffidence. People engage uh, in conflict often to protect themselves out of self-defense, for example. And the third is for reputation. Yeah? And he says something quite important about that. Our reputations, you know, think about Facebook, right? Think about cancel culture. Think about the things that happen in today's world uh, that, that can either gain or lose reputation. People take them very seriously. Yeah? And the, but Hobbes doesn't. He says this is, this is a matter of trifles. Uh, yeah, cyberbullying for sure, Ramsey. So Hobbes says that the third, this business about glory or reputation, we're also concerned about what others think of us. Yeah, we want to have good reputation. He says this can bring you very quickly into conflicts. It's trifles is a trifle is an is nothing. Trifle is a is is not even is something that's not significant. And Hobbes says that you can get into conflict with somebody very easily over a word, a smile, a different opinion. And any sign of undervalue, either direct in their persons or by reflection in their kindred or their friends or their nation, the profession of their name. Isn't it easy to provoke conflict with somebody by saying the wrong word? That's truer today than it has been. Than the Internet in a nutshell, that's right. And this is this is written in 1651, okay, long before anything like the Internet. But it's human nature. So if it's about human nature, then the fact that we have a digital revolution doesn't change our nature necessarily. And this is the point, that it's very easy to provoke conflicts by saying the wrong word or by smiling at somebody in, in, a, you know, in a way that they don't like or a difference of opinion or anything you say about a person or their family or their religion or their profession or their nation, you can very easily provoke conflict, can you not? And Hobbes says these are trifles, but it all has to do with our inflated sense of wanting to have a good reputation or wanting to be respected. And when we're disrespected, we can definitely react in violent ways. So th that's exactly right, Jesse. What we're seeing now in our culture, and it's not just New York City, it's across Western civilization that anybody who says the wrong thing or looks the wrong way or makes the wrong gesture can end up in a, you know, in a very bad place. So this is exactly what Hobbes is saying, and he said it 400 years ago almost. So he says this is what his conclusion is, right? During the time, it is manifest, he said, therefore it is, it is clear, it is obvious, it is apparent, that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war. And such a war is of every man against every man. This is our natural state, he says. This is how we were, how we were born into the world. So it's unfortunately our natural state. And a common power to keep us all in awe is the thing that will stop conflict. A common power. When we can't disagree, I'm sorry, when we can't agree on who that power will be, we're going to end up in civil war. If we can agree on a common power, then we will be able to live in peace and harmony because that common power will keep us all in awe. Now, awe is another word we don't use very much, interestingly enough, although we have two big derivatives that we use all the time. Awe is a root word of what? What words remind you of awe in the English language? Anyone want to put it in the chat room? What words are formed from that root word awe, A-W-E? Awesome is one of them. Brandon, correct. Ramsey's correct. And by awesome, we mean a great thing, right? And Jesse has given us the other one, awful. And by awful, we mean a terrible thing. So isn't it interesting that this word awe can be spun in two opposite directions? Awesome means great, uh, and awful means terrible, but that's the same root. And it can also be terrifying. That's right, Jesse. It has a biblical root, again, and the word awe means both fear and love. So we are supposed to be in awe of God. In the Abrahamic faiths, we love God, but we also fear God. Yes? So this is the root of awe. 
And Hobbes is saying that in political life, we also need a common power to keep us all in awe. So we need a power in political life that we both fear and love also. And if we don't have that, then law and order will break down. We will end up acting on our own desires. We'll end up being drawn into violent competitions, into violent kinds of, of mistrust, and into violent reactions to being disrespected. So we need a common power. And that is partly pointing to his solution to civil war, a common power. And when that common power is, is, is non-existent or breaks down, then we're going to end up in this war of all against all. And if there was never a common power to begin with, which he thinks there never was originally, there's just going to be a constant war of everybody against everybody. And only um, uh, when we make alliances uh, do, do we do so in order to protect us against p potentially a greater power. So it's not like our allies are trusted either. We just make alliances because we think it benefits us. It's just pretty cynical, right? Pretty cynical. But unfortunately, it has a lot of empirical evidence to support it. So he goes on to describe how terrible that is because he's not a fan of this. And he says, you know, when, there's, when we're in a state of war like this, of all against all, a state of chaos, essentially, there's a lot of things we can't do. Economies will be destroyed. Cultures will be destroyed. All these things in the paragraph are... And then there's a very famous line at the end where he says, we will all be living in continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. That's one of the very famous utterances from Leviathan that's quoted very often today, that our lives, in the absence of a common power, may turn out to be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And if you think about our natural life expectancy, if you have peace and reasonable medical care, we're pushing the envelope way past 80 now. If you look at countries which are torn by civil war, where there's really violence, you know, as, as on a daily basis, life expectancy can be as, as short as 30 or 40 for the average adult. So he's not wrong about this. When we have peace and stability, we live longer. When we have a breakdown of law and order, when we have open conflict going on, whether it's in a neighborhood or whether it's in the whole country, we're going to end up with people living in this way. And it's very undesirable. And then Hobbes says, if you don't agree with this, he asks you to conduct a thought experiment. This is actually a trick question. Okay, this is very, very clever and extremely important. So please consider it well, as he's asking you to do. Let him therefore consider with himself. You, he says, should consider, you know, on your own terms. When taking a journey, he arms himself and seeks to go well accompanied. In Hobbes' day, if you were going, uh, you know, from riding your horse, let's say, from one town to another, you would definitely ride armed. You would have a sword, a dagger, and maybe a pistol, and you would also go with friends. Why? Why would you arm yourself when you were traveling on a road, you know, on a highway uh, by horseback from one place to another? Why would you go armed, and why would you seek to go perhaps with friends and not alone? What were you afraid of? Anybody? No ideas? Thieves, yes, Ramses. Highway robbers, they're called. There were people who made a living, you know, camped out on desolate stretches of road between towns. So they would basically ambush people, you know, and rob them. So you would go armed and you'd seek to go well accompanied. Well, excuse me, we still do that today, don't we? I mean, Americans are armed to the teeth. And when we walk around... At times, we're, we're encouraged to walk with others, yes? When we go to certain places, we're encouraged to go with others. When we ride on a subway, we're encouraged to ride with others, not alone in a car. Otherwise, you may set yourself up as a prey for some predator, right? So we still do that. When going to sleep, he locks his doors. Well, excuse me, do any of you leave your doors unlocked at night? I don't think so. So what Hobbes is saying in 1651 is still pretty much applicable today. We all lock our doors. And even when in your house, he says, he locks his chests. So you have little things that you secret away. I guarantee each one of you, if you're living in a household, you know, with others, you probably have little secret stashes where you put stuff 
right? A safe, sure. Or maybe you hide stuff in the sugar or the flour or what, you know, we all have little hiding places. And even when you're in a house with people you're related to, you still have little hiding places for stuff. OK, and this, he says, you know perfectly well that there are laws and public officers who are armed to revenge all injuries that shall be done. As long as we don't defund them completely, we know that there's a police force out there. So Hobbes asks you, what opinion do you have? of others what opinion do you have of your fellow subjects when you ride armed what opinion do you have of your fellow citizens when you lock your doors and what opinion do you have of your children and your servants if you have those in the house when you lock your chests are you not there as much accusing mankind by your actions as i do by my words aren't you saying by what you do that you have mistrust for people and that you have fear of people maybe doing something to you, you know, being a victim of crime. Of course, of course, it's a very good point, Jesse. So he's saying, you don't like what I have to say about human nature. Hobbes says, just look at your own actions and your own actions will tell you that you are on your guard against others. And that's because basically you can't trust everybody. And because you know they're going to be people out there who may wish to do harm to you or to rob you or to victimize you in some way. Not everybody. But nonetheless, you take prudent action. And so Hobbes is saying, do you are not are you aren't you accusing mankind in the same way as me by your actions? But this is also a trick question. So please keep your thinking caps on, because this is really the key point. And this is what brought him the death sentence. What he's about to say now is what brought the death sentence on him. And it's as follows. But neither of us accuse man's nature in it. In other words, he's saying we are dangerous animals. Humans are dangerous, self-regarding, egoistic people, but that's our nature. It's not our fault. This is how we're made, or this is how we're evolved. However you want to spin it, this is how God made us, or if you like, this is how evolution made us, but this is our nature. And this is the next thing that brought him into mortal danger himself. The desires and other passions of man, Hobbes says, are in themselves no sin. So all the things that you want out of life and all the things that you're prepared to do to get what you want out of life and all the crimes of passion that you may be driven to commit, he says this in themselves are not sinful. This is your nature. Your nature cannot be blamed. Now, does anybody know who he's contradicting when he says that our natures are not sinful? Do any of you know by name the doctrine that he is contradicting, or by name the person who came up with that doctrine centuries before Hobbes, so that the majority of people in Hobbes' day believed just the opposite. They believed that we were sinful by nature. Does anybody know this, either by name or by doctrine? Very important to understand why that sentence would have brought the death penalty on Hobbes. All right, if some of you don't know, um, I'll just say it's the doctrine of original sin. I'm sure some of you know this. The doctrine of original sin. Yes? Uh, well, it's not just Adam and Eve. It's the interpretation of Adam and Eve. Okay, that's the key. Very good. Some of you are getting this. But it's the interpretation of original sin. And the person who made that interpretation is St. Augustine in his City of God. That's a formative work of Catholicism, the Roman Church. So St. Augustine's doctrine of original sin is a doctrine that Hobbes is contradicting flat out because St. Augustine said the reason why Adam and Eve um, were kicked out of Eden, uh, St. Augustine, is because our natures are sinful, because God made us this way and we had free will, and because our natures are sinful, we chose to eat the apple. And that's because we have a sinful nature. And Hobbes says that's nonsense. We're just the way we are. Now, let me, let me bring this into clarity for you. We're thinking about ourselves in a state of nature, right? He says, the desires and other passions are in themselves no sin, nor, nor anything that we do that proceeds from those passions until they know a law that forbids them, which till laws be made they cannot know nor can any law be made till they have agreed upon the person that shall make it. So in other words, if we're in a state of nature without a power to keep us all in awe, then nothing is right or wrong, nothing is just or unjust, because there are no laws in place against which we can measure such conduct. 
So in a state of nature, whatever happens, happens. It's what we call the law of the jungle, is it not? Exactly. When you go to the jungle or you go to a wild place and you watch animals killing each other for food, well, we would say definitely lions and tigers and sharks and venomous snakes are dangerous, but they're not morally bad, are they? That's right, Ramsey. She's saying that we're not inherently sinful. It's just how we're made. And so the answer to this other question, Jesse is just saying, no, it's just nature. We're not saying that lions are sinful. I mean, lions kill beautiful little innocent, you know, deer and other things that they eat. We're saying they're obviously dangerous, but they're not sinful because that's how they're made, right? Sharks will take a bite out of people. We know this. Um, and, and yet we don't say that sharks are sinful. We say sharks are dangerous. That's for sure. But we don't say they're sinful because that's how they're made. Yes, they do what they're made to do. We don't say they're sinful. It's because they don't have a choice. And Hobbes is saying the same about us. This is the big controversy. Hobbes is saying, excuse me, in a state of nature, he says, if we don't have any laws, then we're just going to do whatever we want. And no one can say it's right or wrong because it's just our nature. We're so definitely dangerous animals, obviously dangerous animals. And we're self-regarding. And that only brings us into more danger. But that's not sinful. That's just how we're made. So he is definitely contradicting the doctrine of original sin. He's not denying that we're dangerous and prone to conflict, but he's saying we can't judge that until we have laws because our nature is like this. It, it can't be sinful. It's just how it is. That, in 1651, was enough to bring the death sentence on him for heresy. Please understand this. To say this in 1651 was definitely to commit heresy against the doctrine of original sin. So this is his point to this war of every man against every man in a state of nature, right, without a common power to keep us all in awe, this is also consequent, that nothing can be unjust. You can't talk about justice or injustice in the jungle. You can't talk about justice or injustice in the deep ocean. You can't talk about justice or injustice in any natural habitat because whatever happens is just the forces of nature playing out against each other, and that is neither sinful nor saintly. It's just natural. And he says we're in that same predicament when we are originally wandering the earth, that nothing that we do can be said to be just or unjust. In a state of nature, he says the notions of right and wrong, justice and injustice, have their no place. Because when there is no common power, there's no law. And when there's no law, there's no injustice. Force and fraud are in war the two cardinal virtues. So it is also consequent to the same condition that there be no propriety, no dominion, no mine and thine distinct, but that to be every man's that he can get and for so long as he can keep it. So in other words, there's, there's no property rights either. You can't say, well, this belongs to me because in a state of nature, you know, what you have is just whatever you're able to hang on to. And if someone takes it away from you, well, then, then it's theirs. It's not like they violated any law because in a state of nature, once again, there are no laws. So you can't claim that you own something because it's just, you know, your ability to hang on to it. That's right, first come, first serve. So how do we get out of this? Well, this is a pretty terrible predicament. Let me ask you a question. Have any of you read Lord of the Flies? I don't know if they're still teaching this. You have. Oh, that's good. All right. Well, this is a cautionary tale, right? It's a fable by Golding. But Lord of the Flies is precisely about this, right? It's, it's, it's an illustration um, of, a, of a group, those who haven't read it, I won't spoil the story, but I see quite a few, a few of you have. Now, do you see that Golding is telling a Hobbesian story here? Because he's saying, look, here's a bunch of so-called civilized young children. I mean, supposedly civilized, right? Supposedly well brought up, supposedly good table manners and all the rest of it. And then they're shipwrecked on a, or, or, you know, in a plane crash or whatever. They find themselves on some uninhabited island and all the adults are gone. There's no more power to keep them all in awe. And what happens? They totally break down into a state of uh, nature, don't they? They end up in, 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 they become basically what we would today call savages. They behave savagely against each other. That veneer of civilization is quickly, uh, quickly stripped away and they enter a Hobbesian state of nature. So that's a cautionary tale about what happens when common power is removed, 
when people are thrown back on their own desires. So there's a way out. I mean, he's not going to leave you totally depressed uh, by this view of human nature. He's going to say we do have a way out, but we're not going to be able to use our reason to do it. Unlike Aristotle and Plato, who think we can use that power of rationality to control the other two elements of the soul. Remember the Greek soul. So the power of reason in the long run supposedly can, in fact, control our instincts and control our emotions. Hobbes says no. In fact, we have to use our emotions to influence our reason. And the passions, meaning the emotions, that incline us to peace would be fear of death, desire of such things as are necessary to commodious living, to harmonious and prosperous living, to flourishing, and a hope by their industry to obtain them. So if we have a fear of violent death, if we have a desire to have a, a life that is a flourishing life, and we have some hope by our work and our effort to obtain those things, we will tend, therefore, to want to emerge from the state of nature, and we will find a way to establish a government and laws and abide by them. That's what he's saying. But that is, you know, going to be explained in much more depth in the next episode where we where we look at, well, what is the real solution? How do we actually get from a state of nature into a commonwealth? He is going to solve that problem, but he's only going to solve it for the case of civil war. And as you'll see, the solution, as I mentioned earlier, the solution to the problem of civil war will unfortunately set us up for international war. And Hobbes says, I can't do anything about that, but he can certainly do something about civil war. Is this clear to you, uh, this sort of natural state? And this would explain naturally, in Hobbes's view, a lot of conflicts that unfold even in a relatively peaceful society. We're still going to have all kinds of conflicts going on. Well, all right, if it makes sense, read it again and read it more deeply so you can understand his logic. His argumentation is very carefully constructed. He's using his definitions of things like good and bad, definitions of power, definitions of equality to show us how we end up in conflict by our very natures. And therefore, we need to take special steps in order to resolve those conflicts and live somewhat in peace. OK, so are there any last questions? I'll wrap this up for today. Uh, fascinating. Yes, he's a fascinating philosopher. And as I said, Jesse, he, he holds up a mirror. Not everybody wants to look in that mirror, but we're certainly, according to Hobbes, a pretty dangerous kind of animal, mostly to each other. We are egoistic. We are self-regarding. We are sometimes very short-sighted. And we're definitely prone to acting out on emotion. And we're definitely prone, uh, if we're not kept in awe, uh, to, to basically uh, ending up in all kinds of conflicts. And unfortunately, we can look out the window and see that happening as we speak. So we need a power to keep us all in awe, says Hobbes. How we actually arrange this and set this up and maintain it is going to be the task of subsequent chapters of the Leviathan. But this 13th chapter is a very notorious one, and it provokes uh, reactions to this day. Okay, so you've now met a very famous philosopher, and you can see why he's making us think carefully about ethics, among other things. But this also is a direct route to political philosophy. Okay. Um, I think I will leave it there. Mission accomplished today. Uh, we'll continue in my breakout group on Thursday to look at his solution to this problem. And I hope you will do that in your other breakout groups as well. And yes, he's made a huge impact, Ramses, politically, because, as I say, his solution to this problem is going to be unfolded via what he calls a social contract. And so social contractarianism is going to be a way by which we can maintain peaceful and prosperous relations with each other, but it also means that we have to abide by certain laws. Those laws will have to be enacted, and there has to be a justice system in order to basically call to account those who transgress the laws, but there is a way to get out of this problem, and uh, his impact is very definite. You will see his social and his political impact both as you study him, uh, and if you look online at Hobbes, uh, you'll, you'll find a lot of information there, and you will see that he's still an extremely important philosopher, okay, for all these reasons that we've seen today. Okay, so um, I think we'll leave it there. Are there any, is there any one last question? Does anybody uh, have any burning question to ask? Uh, if so, uh, maybe I'll take it. Is there no absolute way of living? What does that mean, Arsh? You're asking me again, not everybody. Is there no absolute way? I don't know what that means, absolute way of living. 
Hobbes tells us that we need a power to keep us all in awe. Oh, about good and bad, right and wrong. Well, Hobbes is saying in a state of nature, if we don't have a common power to keep us all in awe, then nothing is good or bad or right or wrong. That's the problem. Everybody is a law unto themselves. And that obviously is a recipe for disaster. So for Hobbes, there is no absolute way of living in a state of nature. We're all going to be drawn into perpetual conflict for the reasons he's enunciated. But we get out of the state of nature into a commonwealth. Then we have a government that we all transfer power to. And we agree that we're going to abide by its laws and, and maybe change them if they're unjust. But basically, we can only talk about justice relative to a constitution and a government. In a state of nature, there's no such thing as injustice any more than we could call lions and tigers and sharks and vipers unjust. We don't. We say they're dangerous, but they don't behave wrongly because they're made that way by nature. And the same thing with humans. Unlike those other animals, we can do something about it. And that's an optimistic note on which to close. Unlike those animals which are dangerous by nature and can't change their natures, humans can emerge from a state of nature, so-called Hobbesian state of nature, into a commonwealth. But again, we're going to have to consider Hobbes's prescription for exactly how to achieve this. And that will be our work next day. Okay, I wish you all a very happy day, a safe day. And I'm glad, Aisha, that you found it interesting. Hobbes is always interesting because he makes us think, right? Uh, that's Thank you, Professor. Have a good one. You're more than welcome. You have a great day, too. And I'll look forward to seeing some of you um, on Thursday. And the rest of you, I hope you'll have some reason to think seriously about Hobbes. Okay, have a wonderful day, wonderful week. I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Be well.